Jana Reese led a great discussion um, that really that covers some of the ground but elaborates on the ground that we covered in our intro. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a great lunch, and we're delighted to see that there really hasn't been very much attrition from the morning crowd. So thank you for your coming back and for your patience. So this afternoon, instead of having individual papers presented, we have three sessions that will be dealing with one aspect or another of this question of translation and then posing questions to the panel as a whole. And this first one is really focused on scriptural translation. And so thanks to the Faith Matters Foundation for the slides as well as just about everything today. Yay. Um, yay. Thank you. We wanted to open this first session of the afternoon with just a little bit of terminology. Panelists have been throwing around some terms that you may or may not be familiar with. And some of our discussion is going to hinge upon these terms of tight control and loose control. So we're just going to take a quick moment at the beginning to explain them. As you can see here, these both are from Royal Skousen, whose uh, specter is over everything we do today as one of the scholars who has kind of set the standard for a particular type of interpretation of translation in the Book of Mormon. The tight control model is this verbatim dictation. That's what we're talking about with uh, tight control. Lines of text that Joseph Smith is seeing. This is what Skousen is claiming is the model. And then we are thinking about new models that could be loosely included in this term, loose control. And so by loose control, we're saying that Joseph Smith is using his own words and that the translator has impressions, thoughts, feelings that are going to be uh, part of the final product. So one of the things that we're going to consider here is the strengths and weaknesses of this tight control model. A uh, couple of the things that are listed here that may not be news to you. The tight control model does uh, offer us some things that are important, one of which I would point out is the second here, explaining apparent Hebraisms in the text, such as chiasmus and language structure. We're going to get to that in a minute. And then it, the idea generally is that this is easier to understand. It is easier to explain to someone, Joseph Smith translated this by seeing it word for word than it is to say, we don't know how much of Joseph Smith is in this text and how much of it is ancient. Um, much more is left to be discussed and to be wrestled with in the loose control model. So some of the questions that come up, and they may come up in our discussion here, when you use the tight control model, what do you do with anachronisms in the Book of Mormon? As Roz was saying earlier, if you have a loose control model, you have more flexibility in trying to understand where those anachronisms may have come into the text, or if there are 19th century elements that don't necessarily make sense, the loose control model gives you more wiggle room in understanding that. Um, grammatical errors, certain um, insertions of the King James Version of the Bible, which include translation errors in the King James Version itself, verbal missteps, and also finally uh, redundant passages. You may not have noticed, but there are some redundancies in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> Just throw that out there. So for my first question to all of you lovely people, I would like you to tell me when did you first encounter the work of Royal Skousen, this idea of the tight control model, and how did you engage with it? What are its strengths and weaknesses in your minds? Oh. Oh. I will confess that I did not know much about Royal Skousen's work until after I read Brent Gardner's book. Uh, and you would wonder whether I could have an objective take on... Sam, say the title of Brant's book, By the Gift and Power. By, by the Gift and Power. 
uh, Colford published it. Uh, my kids, when they were younger, when they wanted to refer to someone <coughs> in the past, would say the another day, and mm -hmm. it meant sometime between yesterday and the creation of the cosmos. So it was published by Covert Books, the another day, <laughs> and it's gift and power uh, translation. Translating the Book of Mormon. Translating the Book of Mormon. So I did not have a time of growing up with. Cle or, uh, I'm so bad with that, with Royal Skousen's uh, work. So for me, encountered it and had a pretty similar impression to what Jared has indicated, that it felt like it was a long way around back to the old reminiscent accounts of the supernatural teleprompter. I'm, I'm sympathetic. I mean, my goodness. Our encounters with divinity and grace are so few and far between that this model the possibility that the Book of Mormon is an utterly unalloyed encounter with divine grace with no human involvement. I understand the hunger to be in the presence of that kind of <coughs> event or artifact. And I think that, that both the reminiscences and the argument that Skousen makes for tight control are in some respects an attempt to say, I really would just like, for just this please, an an unadulterated, unalloyed encounter with the divine. So I'm sympathetic to that. I haven't found it academically persuasive to me, and as a believer, continue to be hungry for the presence of the divine, even as I recognize that it, that God's presence is almost always inextricably tied to our own mortal experience. I came across uh, Royal's work when I was doing my own book, By the Hand of Mormon, so that was back in 2003 and four. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm just wondering if I'm the only person who, here at the table, who thinks that in many ways we've created a false dichotomy that doesn't serve us well. Because if Schleiermacher is correct, that translation is always constrained by the conceptual vocabulary of the interlocutor, then God could have been, or the Spirit could have been dictating to Joseph Smith, but would have been strictly limited by his own conceptual imagination. <clears throat> and it seems to me that that kind of a conflation is the only way that you could explain Hebraisms on the one hand, and what seem to be 19th century colloquialisms and, and motifs on the other. Pinging on that question, actually, I would like to specifically ask about chiasmus and some of these Hebraic notions that we have. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I couldn't see you, Richard. Now I see you. This sense that somehow the tight control is more purely godly than the loose control has never struck me as, as very significant. Either way, there is so much material that goes into that uh, Book of Mormon text that to my way of understanding his culture and his society goes so far beyond his natural capacities that it, it must have been uh, you know, a huge amount of either absolutely unparalleled genius or the, the Spirit of God leading. I also had this problem that I read it and I'm like Sam, I thought, golly, he really is nailing it down that uh, this had to be from God, it's not coming from his own mind. But then I tried to repeat the argument to someone with real examples. I never could do it. It's, it's so technical that somehow the persuasiveness of it is lost. You're sort of hypnotized by his finesse and in interpreting every little comma, every pause, every little blot of ink as uh, indicating that uh, it's tightly controlled. Uh, but it, it just sort of fell apart. And I'm always suspicious of uh, arguments that uh, don't hold up when you try to interpret them into ordinary language. <laughs> Most of academic contributions fall into that category. Yeah, exactly. He's emeritus now, so he doesn't care if he <laughs> makes fun of you guys in the humanities. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Quickly, on the question of the chiasmus, um, I remember as a gospel doctrine teacher printing out a chart of Alma 36, bringing it to gospel doctrine and 
and showing them the structure uh, and how important that was for them. What do you say about this? You know, Terrell has just told us it's possible that we have an expansive model that can include both, that can allow for this Hebraic influence and also more modern accretions. I'm never quite sure how to say certain things. It occurs to me that the model that I've described of panoramic visions or a special kind of communion with the ancient American descendants of Lehi is perhaps uniquely able to capture the cadences of Hebrew or Lehi Hebrew writing in a way that the translation of the glyphs couldn't because based on everything we know, I think Terrell has very usefully reminded of, of the context and implications, but based on what we know from Joseph Smith about the nature of hieroglyphs, individual hieroglyphs tend to carry a solid paragraph or two of import. So how would you arrange reformed Egyptian coded glyphs in a way that would actually, in a strictly linguistic model, carry over chiasms and other Hebraisms. I'm not persuaded that that model actually gets there. Now, of course, with historical providentialism, you can make anything work. God, God is not constrained, and God could very easily dictate in languages that are appropriate to Joseph Smith Hebraisms that needed to be communicated. Speaking as an academic, not as a believer now, that strikes me as not trying hard enough to engage argument. But I'm, I, I think we've had this model that Reformed Egyptian is fancy Hebrew, but it's not. And it's not clear to me how we get those Hebraisms unless there's something other than a linguistic translation of these coded Egypto-Hebrew glyphs. Uh, I, w I wish Nick Frederick of the BYU faculty were here. I, he has done uh, close studies of the infusion of biblical phrases into the Book of Mormon text. And I think the figure, wasn't it uh, Phil? Phil had this number to begin with, something like 50,000 three-word phrases that are exactly like come from the Bible, some huge amount. So that the Book of Mormon, uh, and actually all of Joseph Smith's revelations, and many of his letters, are just uh, inundated with biblical language. And whatever the source of the book, uh, it shows, of, of the Book of Mormon text, it shows the presence of a biblical mentality uh, you know, that, that really is beyond anything that uh, we can scarcely imagine. And if that mentality is informing phrases and the uses of biblical language, the presence of chiasmus in there is just sort of an extension of this deep familiarity or the family kinship between the Book of Mormon text and the, the biblical text. So standing alone, I don't think it, um, it does anything more than show that whoever dictated that book uh, knew the Bible deeply. It was ingrained into their mental patterns. Richard, may I? Um, a follow-up on that, Richard. <clears throat> One um, extension or italicization of your point is that Joseph, um, that these units of three or five or eight or more words from the King James Version of the Bible become vocabulary units for Joseph. They actually become part of the way he speaks. Um, and so that reinforces the idea of the biblically soaked consciousness. But Jack Welch's um, arguments for chiasmus sometimes extend to a chiastic structure that's as long as a Book of Mormon chapter, which is a very long chiasmus to just say he was familiar. Would you think that, would that affect your comment or would it, do you imagine that um, Joseph Smith's 
writing in those structures, translating whatever he's translating with that kind of Hebraic structure is unconsciously mm -hmm. um, absorbed by him because he's so soaked in biblical um, material? Well, <coughs> what changes when you say it extends to a, an entire chapter? Does that mean it's more biblical or just that it's more deft in the management of chiastic poetry? I heard a lot of noddies, but I give me words. <laughs> After the length of the chiasm is the only implication is that that's much more difficult to manage as a spontaneous oral production, right? It, it, it would seem to require um, something else. Yeah, I think that, I mean, the fundamental question here is, is whence the Hebraisms, right? Like, are they things that could only, in their, in their intricacy, could we, could only be in the plate text and could only have been read off in the supernatural teleprompter model, or can we account for them uh, uh, by way of Joseph Smith's saturation by um, uh, King James Version uh, of Bible sort of language, right? Um, do they, can the Hebraisms, Hebraisms be traced to um, the King James Version of the Bible, right, which makes an effort in its translation to, to reproduce, right, um, elements of, um, of ancient Hebrew poetry, parallelism, chiasmus, et cetera, or are there, is there, are there some examples that, 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 that somehow discount that, um, that explanation, right, which is the most ready the, the most ready explanation, right? Again, I think that Brent Gardner systematically sort of takes on some of the sort of classic examples of Hebraism in the Book of Mormon, and to my mind is, I think, persuasive that one could explain them um, as, um, as arising from a deep familiarity with the King James Version of the Bible. The other point to make about chiasmus and parallelism and sort of the, the form of the Book of Mormon is, um, is that these specific forms one could see as actually lending themselves as sort of aids to memory and to sort of an oral dictation process. That is to say, some of the, the features of the text that have been highlighted as inevitable, as, as inescapable evidence, right, of, of a reading off of something, actually looked at again, when you think of all those you know, low semantic density sort of markers of and it came to pass or just you imagine Joseph Smith dictating something and in some cases Oliver Cowdery reading the text back to him, right? And um, that, that lends itself to a certain kind of ponderous parallelism forming, right? One could see like, well, I've just heard what I just, I just said, now I'm going to I'm going to add the next unit, right? So parallelism, chiasmus, some of these, these things that are seen as, as evidence of Hebrew poetry and linked to ancient texts could also be seen, right, as, as actually features of a dictation uh, model. An incredible feat, let's you know, hasten to say, but I think it's important to keep, for many reasons, to keep um, you know, a naturalistic explanation in, in play, right? That it would be extraordinary for Joseph Smith to have done this, but I don't think it is beyond the pale to imagine that somebody of his evident talent and capacity, right, could, 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 could produce um, this sort of text. And then if, yeah, if you are, are of a, uh, another persuasion, you can always sort of Pump in a little divine enhancement if you want to. If you want to. Well, now uh, it, it, just notice the bias that you said. We got to leave open naturalism, uh -huh. but if we want the alternative, we can pump in and some well, of pseudo Freudian, <laughs> like have no, a little I, balance. Well, no, 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 no. All I'm saying is that um, uh, what we're we're just back to the genius inspiration question, right? Correct. That I think, I think that you know you could account for the text as the product of sure. a. Genius, and I think that there is evidence in uh, plenty of evidence in Joseph Smith for characterizing him as such. But also, yes, um, I think that there. That what I take Sam to be to to be doing is that what's the what's the difference? What's gained? What's lost by sort of locating divine inspiration in the supernatural teleprompter as opposed to 
this extraordinary dictation of the text. That is, in either case, right, from within a sort of believer standpoint, there's divine inspiration occurring. So it's an interesting question, like why, why, why would one prefer the supernatural teleprompter as the site at which the divine inspiration happens, as opposed to some sort of other process right. that is enabling Joseph Smith to, by, yeah, uh, by some accounts, do something that he couldn't possibly have done himself. I think that's an interesting question. So, like, so um, you know, for you know, what is it from the Book of Mormon musical? Mormons just believe. Like, Mormons just believe, right? Like, we're willing to believe crazy things, right? So, what's what's at stake then in in saying it's a divine process, but the divinity is entering at point A as a point as opposed to point B, right? The word genius is. Uh, as Jared pointed out earlier, it is a very interesting one. He spoke about the genius as a spirit that inspires you. Uh, that's an earlier usage. But what is our usage today? Genius means people who accomplish things that are beyond normal human capacities. And the question is, um, what is the difference between someone who does something beyond normal hum human capacities and one who's receiving inspiration from God. My own view is that the naturalists uh, are, should come up with some parallel text. You know, a 24-year-old uh, young man with no writing experience, only this oral testing, but has produced nothing, nothing that we know of that was anything like the Book of Mormon prior to that time, save maybe the stories he told around the household. So that just in purely naturalistic terms, it's going to be very hard to distinguish what is human capacity and what uh, we can attribute to divine afflatus of some kind. <laughs> Thank you. Aflatus, good word yes, to get into. Yes, I wasn't going to call attention to that. <laughs> yeah. well, it's better that. than pup in, brother. <laughs> I, I want you, I want you to, I want you to answer my question though about like, okay, so, so within a within a believer's paradigm, right? Um, what's, what, why, what does it matter? What's what's gained? What's lost by, you know, locating the pumping in at, um, at. Um, at one point as opposed to the other, right? So you're, you seem to be saying that, um, uh, sorry, right, no divine teleprompter necessarily, and Joseph Smith is, you know, performing this incredible feat of, if we, you know, follow the, um, the accounts of the translation that we have, which I think we have every, every reason to do, um, that, um, that no, the, 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 the divine is entering at the point of, Joseph Smith orally dictating this um, in this extraordinary fashion. So what, yeah, what's lost, what's gained by shifting from one to the other? Because they both admit uh, divine inspiration and, and thus theoretically could be available to, to, uh, to Mormon believers. We need to move on. Wait, Rick, I did it again. <laughs> Guys, you have to help me, Richard. I think I'm just going to go to the bathroom if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, please tell us what you wanted to say. Uh, just briefly, uh, the argument you made earlier, Jared, about it's in keeping with the Mormon style, that when divine things happen, humans are involved. The whole point is not for us to just be empty vessels in which he pours his truths, but that we participate mm -hmm. in receiving them and enacting them. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to preserve above all in this whole thing is not the historicity of the Book of Mormon. We're trying to pre pre preserve the presence of God in the whole process. We want to reach God mm -hmm. through that Book of Mormon, through the nature of the text and through the process of receiving it. So uh, I'm, I'm with you. I really think when I'm in, in saying that uh, God may have just been energizing the mind of Joseph Smith to turn this out. Mm 
But I will say that uh, despite all the naturalist arguments, I still do not believe that no matter what his genius, he could have done it as himself. And I, 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 what I want is a text of similar complexity produced under such primitive conditions with so little background or training or precedence to turn out his masterwork, not at the end of his career, but at the beginning of his career, just as he's getting started. That, that seems to me um, really beyond uh, anything you could call natural. Thank you. Oh, is that a mic drop? <laughs>